Hi, my name is Reagan Welch. I'm a biology major here at SWU, and I have been the obnoxious coffer in the front row, so just <laughs> bear with me. The research I'm going to be discussing with you today is titled The Investigation of Moringa Oliphera Leaf Extract and its Cancer-Selective Anti-Proliferative Properties. So for starters, what is Moringa? Moringa is a small tree that is native to the dry tropics. By dry tropics, we're talking about Central America, India, and parts of Africa. Moringa has also played a huge role in traditional medicine. It is said that Moringa can prevent up to 300 diseases and has curative properties for a range of others, ranging from wound healing to digestive ailments. If you've heard of Moringa in the news, you may have heard of it termed as a superfood that is more nutritious than kale. It is said that Moringa has more calcium than milk, more potassium than bananas, more vitamin A than carrots. This list of nutritional benefits goes on and on. However, the quality of Moringa that we're going to focus on today is its possible cancer killing abilities. So these quotes here are just a few that have been found in past research papers that have established this relationship between Moringa leaf extract and its effect on cancer cells. From some of these quotes, you can see that Moringa possesses anti-cancer activity, significantly reduces cancer cell proliferation, and Moringa generally being referred to as a cure-all for ailments from cancer to hysteria. From these conclusions, it may appear as though the question has already been answered, that Moringa is a cancer killer. However, diving into these papers and looking at their methodology, you soon see that they never took their same Moringa leaf extract and applied it to healthy, normal cells. It's difficult to say you have a possible cancer treatment if you could be killing your healthy cells at the same rate or possibly an even greater rate. If you put a strong enough chemical on any type of cells, they will die. They're sensitive creatures. Therefore, it's absolutely necessary to determine if we have a cancer-selective anti-proliferative treatment by applying Moringa to both cancerous and non-cancerous cells. So, as mentioned before, Moringa does not grow natively to the United States. Therefore, it made it a little bit interesting to get a hold of this plant. Um, after making a few phone calls, I had a gallon-sized bag of Moringa seeds sent from a research lab at Johns Hopkins University. This fine individual here is Dr. <laughs> Jed Fahey. He was actually the generous provider of our Moringa seeds. He's a Moringa, Moringa researcher up at John Hopkins. He doesn't study Moringa and cancer specifically, but more of its great nutritional uses. And I had a phone interview with this gentleman and thought it was only necessary to have a, take a selfie with him in honor of his contribution to this research. <laughs> So those seeds were planted and were allowed to grow in the environmental chamber here at SWU all last spring semester. Once they had reached a substantial enough size, the leaves were plucked, dried, and ground into a fine powder to where they could be ran through a Soxlick apparatus with an ethanol solvent to give us our Moringa leaf extract. Now I just used a lot of large words, so I'm going to back up and explain some of those components. So extract. Basically what we're taking is our Moringa leaves and we're making a concentrated sticky goo of all of their good components, whether that be their nutritional components, their cancer killing components, all of that in a concentrated substance. This here is our Soxlet apparatus. How this guy works is you put our Moringa leaf powders actually in little tea bags in this vessel here. Those leaves hang out there while we put ethanol in this bottom round bottom flask. It's sitting on a hot plate so that ethanol is going to vaporize to reach to the top of this tower where it will become cool and will condense into a liquid. That liquid will then drip onto our Moringa leaves. Will, that hot ethanol is going to pull out all those great substances of our Moringa. Once enough ethanol has dripped, it's going to go through all these little glass tubes here and fill back into the bottom. This is allowed to cycle several times, actually over a period of eight hours, of which I was there for every minute of to <laughs> observe this great contraption. And so at that point, we have a really concentrated substance here. Our Moringa leaves have actually turned clear at this point because all their goodies have been ripped out. And we have our Moringa leaf extract. Just to add an extra research component, we also obtained a second source of Moringa, our Cooley Cooley Moringa powder. I apologize ahead of time for the selfies that I like to take with my Moringa sources. So this Moringa here is the type that you would order offline and typically use it for all those great nutritional benefits. Add it to your smoothies, add it to your salads, and you can really 
prevent all those 300 diseases. <laughs> so this, it was already a fine powder, so we ran it through the Soxlick apparatus with an ethanol solvent as well to create a second source of Moringa leaf extract. So our Moringa leaf extract then had to be diluted down to four concentration levels that were found to be the range that was best used in those papers that was previously cited. We also made sure to develop our ethanol control so that we could account for any of the effects that the ethanol could be having on our cell proliferation. We also had to choose our cell lines, so we choose a breast, chose a breast cell pair that consisted of cancerous breast cell and normal breast cell line, as well as two lung cell lines that consisted of cancerous lung cells and healthy lung cells. So our methods can actually be broken down into some pretty simple steps. So for starters, our four cell lines were plated in 96 well plates. Basically means we counted out our cells, we put 5,000 cells per little bitty wells. These guys were allowed to incubate overnight, and the following morning, Moringa was applied to those cells in its four different concentration levels, as well as with its corresponding ethanol control. That was allowed to incubate for 48 hours until cell proliferation was measured. This was done by a process of adding a substance to each of our wells to measure cell metabolism. The results of that resulted in a color change that could then be quantified using a plate reader at 490 nanometers, and this gave us numerical data to run for our statistical analyses. So all of these methods were done using aseptic conditions and were all performed under a sterile cell culture hood. Dr. Tichi, this is was able to take this semi-stage picture of me working in the hood. <laughs> So also important in <laughs> developing a cancer treatment is not only the fact that our cancer cells are dying, but also the method of death those cells are undergoing. So we also prepared them for microscopic imaging. Our four cell lines were plated in an eight-well chamber slide and were applied with the highest and the lowest concentration of Moringa leaf extract. After Following the same methods as before, we only allowed them to incubate for 24 hours, however, in the hopes that we were catching them during that death and dying phase. At this point, we applied a cell staining kit to them where we could determine what method of cell death they were undergoing. So this staining kit dyed our cell nuclei blue, our apoptotic cells green, and our necrotic cells red. So just to go over some of what cell death Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So if we see that, that means that our cells are shriveling up and are not affecting their outer environment. Death by necrosis, however, is an explosion type of cell death where all those intercellular components are infecting the area around it. This can result in an inflammatory response or possible further tumor growth in an in vivo subject. So for a great cancer treatment, we are not wanting a death by necrosis, but rather by apoptosis. This is the fine microscope that I was able to use at the Clemson Light and Imaging Facility. Also a staged photo, but I really did use this microscope. <laughs> All right, so now jumping right into the results. So absorbance values, basically you can interchange that word in your brain to mean relative cell number. So this graph here may look a little confusing, but what it's showing you is the relative cell number of both of our breast cell lines, cancerous and non-cancerous, as well as the cell number that was achieved by that ethanol control. So we want all of our data to be in comparison to that ethanol control so that we can completely throw out any effects that ethanol is having and really understand what our data means. So that is why we use fold change. So this graph here takes our ethanol and that is our black line at level one. All other data is then in comparison to that ethanol control so that we're completely accounting for any effect the ethanol is having. This here is our two breast cell lines, cancerous and non-cancerous, as they're being treated with increasing concentrations of Moringa. In this graph, you may notice there are no stars of significance, there are no identifiable trend lines, and that is exactly what you're supposed to see. We saw no effect of our Moringa leaves on our breast cell lines, cancerous or non-cancerous. This directly contradicts past research which used the exact same cancerous breast cell line and showed that as in Moringa concentration increased, we should have been seeing a death in our cancerous breast cells. However, those results were not reproducible in our case. On to our lung cells. A little bit more interesting here. Absorbance values, once again, replace that in your mind with relative cell number. We're going to focus on our effects or these, this orange and red lines. 
So these lines here are representing the relative cell number of our cancerous lung cells. As you can see, as the Moringa leaf concentration increases, we have a general decrease in cell number. This may seem ideal, that a cancer treatment, this Moringa leaf extract is decreasing our cancerous cells. However, we have to remember that that Moringa leaf extract is made up of not only Moringa, but also the ethanol that it is dissolved in. This here, this black line, is representing what our ethanol alone was doing to our cells. Therefore, if we would have had just those first two lines, we could have came to the same conclusion that all those past researchers did, that our Moringa leaf extract is killing our cancer cells. However, by adding in this control component that the other researchers failed to do, we have the same results but are coming to a different conclusion, that Moringa, in fact, is actually saving these cells while ethanol is having the killing effects. And that is why we use fold change. So here, black line once again is representing the cell number of our ethanol. So we see an increase in our cancerous lung cells with increasing concentrations of Moringa. As you can probably imagine, an ideal cancer treatment should not be causing our cancer cells to grow better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on to our healthy lung cells is where we certainly saw the most surprising data. So at the two lowest concentrations of Moringa, we see that our cell number and our healthy lung cells increased nine to 11 times the cell number that was seen in the control. However, at the two highest levels of Moringa, we see that cell number actually dropped below that of the control. One possible explanation, think back to all those great medicinal uses, nutritional benefits of our Moringa. Perhaps in appropriate, moderated amounts, that Moringa is actually beneficial to the normal healthy cells in our body, while at too high of concentrations, it has detrimental effects just as too much of any substance would. So this graph here just puts us in perspective on the same scale of our healthy lung cells and our cancerous lung cells and the effects that Moringa is having on them. Also, remember we had some microscopic images that we had discussed back in the methods section. So the microscopy data found from our breast cells did not give us any conclusive results, therefore they are not concluded in these, included in these slides. This, however, shows our lung cells. So this green circle here, you can see in the middle there is a multitude of green dots. That is actually the treatment of our healthy lung cells treated with the highest concentration of Moringa. If you can remember, our healthy lung cells died off pretty rapidly at those high concentrations of Moringa, and because of these green dots, we know that that death was occurring by apoptosis. This red circle here is showing the treatment of our cancerous lung cells being applied to with the highest concentration of Moringa. This increase of red dots from the cell right before shows that these cells are actually dying by necrosis. So not only is Moringa not an ideal cancer treatment due to the fact that it's increasing our cancer cell number, but it's also the death that it is causing is occurring by necrosis. So just to put some of those results into perspective, Moringa leaf extract is not an ideal cancer treatment use and is likely not to be a future treatment for patients, for clinical cases, or for future in vivo studies. However, this does not discredit the use of Moringa for its other great uses, those medicinal uses, nutritional benefits, and really taking our future research and expanding upon those great qualities of Moringa. So just some final thoughts, because we did have some contradictory results compared to past studies that have found this relationship between Moringa and cancer cells. There was actually a paper published in mid-January of this past year that contained an article and it discussed the reproducibility problem that's occurring in science. It contained the following quote showing that in reference to current cancer studies, there is a reproducibility problem. So this paper discussed how the reproducibility project of cancer studies took 50 high impact clinical cases from 2010 to 2012 and reproduced them. Of the 50 cases, only 29 had reproducible results. Now, what we know about science is that even though it is about creative solutions, it's even more so about being controlled, reproducible, and reliable. Without these characteristics, we don't have science at all. So even though it would have been much more impressive as an undergraduate researcher to solidify the use of Moringa as a possible future cancer treatment, that's not the results we got. I realized that science is about building off the backs of past researchers, whether that be following up on them, questioning them, and sometimes correcting them when necessary. 
So, as an undergraduate researcher once again, you truly realize the importance of the scientific process and the advancement of the scientific community is really the ultimate goal. So just for a few acknowledgments, I would like to thank my wonderful research mentor, Dr. Ashley Tichy, for devoting so much time to me over the summer and the course of this year for all my meaningful and not so meaningful questions. I would also like to thank my research committee, Dr. Couch and Dr. Cinnamon, Mr. Main, the wonderful honors program director, um, Dr. Jed Fahey, the gentleman y'all got to see a few slides ago, and his contribution of the Moringa seeds, Dr. Way for allowing me to use his lab at Clemson University, Rhonda Powell for helping us out with those very complicated microscopes, and SCICU for supplying the funding for this research. And that concludes my presentation.